Jack, Bob and Tony here in Connecticut. Thanks for coming back on, my friend. Hi, Jack. Hey, Bob. Hey, Tony. How are you? How are it's you? Good to speak with you again. How you been? Everything's good. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Oh, anytime. Again, it's a little pleasure, background. Jack, Jack uh, we talked to him a couple of years ago here on the show. It's great to have him back. He played uh, eight seasons, seven, eight seasons. I think it was seven years Big league for four different teams mm -hmm. between 80 and 86 in Los Angeles, Cleveland, Seattle, and Chicago. 433 major league games, 389 hits, 78 stolen bases, 270 impressive lifetime hitter drafted by the Dodgers back in the 76 draft out of Murray State. And again, the, is the Major League debut was with the Dodgers in 1980. And again, we're very happy to have Jack back. And uh, Jack, as we want to start like we did last time, uh, we want to go back to your younger days. We always like to ask the guest, Jack, about uh, your youth, uh, how you became a baseball player. Was it always baseball, Jack, as a small child with you? And uh, tell us some of your sports heroes, how you really got into baseball as a kid. Yeah, I was like most kids back in my age. Uh, I played all three sports, you know. So in the summer was baseball, the fall was football, and the uh, winter was basketball. And by the time I got to high school, I was too too small for football and basketball for the most part. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I gravitated towards baseball, and that's the one I uh, seemed to have the most success at. So I kind of moved into that. Uh, you know, as a kid, I was always watching baseball on TV and I uh, had many heroes, you know, and the old Yankee team was kind of my favorite when I was growing up, and watching Mickey Mantle and all those guys, mm -hmm. that was uh, quite a thrill, and that kind of hooked me on baseball, I guess. Mm -hmm. And when exactly, Jack, did you realize that you could possibly make a living playing professional ball? You know, until I got drafted, I don't really believe I, I knew for sure, you know, I was... Uh, uh, you know, an average high school player, I didn't get just a little above average, I guess, but I didn't get any kind of college scholarship, so I just walked down and walked on in college. And, um, you know, I had a successful career at Murray State University, so then I started to, uh, you know, hope for the chance, but until I was drafted, I never really believed I could, and uh, that was always my issue with me, is I didn't have a lot of confidence playing, so until... Uh, professional baseball where I started to have some, some success I didn't really believe it was a possibility and uh, you know I just I, I think my lack of confidence spurred me to work harder and so in a way it kind of helped me to, to uh, keep going and uh, yeah all things worked out it was my dream of course. Mm -hmm. Again, we're on the phone with former Major League infielder Jack Perconti. Jack does a lot of uh, instruction now, baseball schooling, things like that. We'll get to that a little later, but Tony, questions. And Jack, uh, good evening. It's a pleasure to have you once again. I'm curious, when uh, you started to make your way up to the Dodger organization and you made your way up to the big club, I mean, you're on this team with Garvey, Lasorda, Monday, Fernando, Johnstone. I mean, were you scared? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt about it. My, my, first game, my first game in Dodger Stadium, I wouldn't let my, ride, I, my eyes rise above the first level of the stadium. I was so uh, intimidated, you know. And, uh, yeah, to be able to be around such great players uh, and uh, coaches, it was really a thrill. And But I was definitely nervous. And it actually took me a couple of years to get beyond that where I could just concentrate and and play my game, you know. So I, I played scared a lot of times in my early years of professional or uh, major league baseball, and that's certainly no way to uh, succeed or to enjoy it, you know. But eventually right. I learned to concentrate through it. Now, how was uh, how was Tommy towards you? Was he, uh, was he the loving Tommy, the gruff Tommy, um, the, the, the unprintable Tommy? You know, you tell us. <laughs> He was all of those, I guess, you know, uh, you know, like most managers at that level, it's kind of, you know, what have you done for me lately? So, you know, if you were going well, he was your buddy, buddy. And when things weren't going so well, you know, you, he wasn't the same, but that, that's the way it is a lot at that level. So, you know, you have to produce in order to uh, get your playing time and, uh, he, he liked his veterans, of course, which I can't blame him, you know, looking back at things, you know, they were 
successful and great. The infield there was awesome. So you could see where uh, he stuck with them more. But, uh, you know, if you play the way you're supposed to play at that level, then everything's great and, uh, you know, the relationships are good. And as we talk with Jack on our TV screen, we have various pictures of him at different stages of his career. And uh, I got also want to let the viewers know out there, Tony, uh, Jack was a member of that 81 Dodger team. Yes, the, he was. the strike year, but they did go on to win the World Series that year. And more about the Dodgers system, Jack. The O'Malley family, I mean, it always seemed to be pretty well respected by... We've had so many former Dodgers on the... On the uh, on the show, and they've always said the way the O'Malley's ran business uh, really is probably the reason why Dodger Stadium is still standing. Can you believe that's one of the oldest ballparks still in use, Jack? Yeah, it is hard to believe, and, uh, you know, it was always my favorite in the National League by far, so I'm so mm -hmm. glad it's still there, and, uh, yeah, the O'Malley's were amazing, and, you know, just the coaches we used to have, uh, you know, growing up or in the minor league system were just guys that were just unbelievable players and it was such a family atmosphere that it really you know it was the envy of all of baseball back in the day and uh so it was it was i was so lucky to come up through that uh system that's for sure and you were there jack when uh, Fernando Mania was in full swing, and Tony and I remember it well. Oh, yeah, it was unbelievable. Just, uh, it was amazing. It was on the game of the week. Uh, did you feel a lot of the same electricity that we did as viewers at home, Jack? Well, you know, the funny thing about Fernando is in the year before, uh, they sent him up to our, uh, from the double-A team, they sent him to the Albuquerque team because we were in the playoffs. You know, a lot yeah. of times they'll bolster the, the roster for the playoffs. Well, they sent... Fernando's the only guy they sent up, and our coach never played him. So we assumed he wasn't much help. And then next year, like you say, <laughs> Fernando Mania broke up and mm. or broke out, and it was just truly amazing. And, uh, you know, to have played with him and actually faced him at winter ball once when I was uh, coming up. And it, it, I always tell everybody that he was the greatest player I ever played with, and mm. not because maybe of talent, but just the unlikelihood of it all, him becoming such a superstar. For and sure. on that Dodger, one more question about the Dodger years, uh, Jack. On that Dodger team, you played with Dusty Baker and Mike Socia, who would go on to be managers and still do it. Uh, at the time, did either one of those guys uh, give you the idea that they uh, were managing material? It was obvious to us players that they were, you know, hmm. especially when you look back a little later, you knew Mike Socia and Dusty, they were leaders on the ball field, you know, along with Ron Rennick, he was another one that from that oh, team yeah. that was a manager for a yeah, while. That's uh, right. Yeah. But yeah, they, uh, it was pretty obvious. Uh, Dusty and Mike were just such students of the game, but also they were such upbeat guys that always were in your corner and pulling for you and helping you out in tough times. So it, it was no surprise that they both been so successful. That's for sure. Tony. And, Jack, you, you find yourself leaving Los Angeles and going to Cleveland. Uh, were you brokenhearted about this, or was it like, hey, I really got a chance to play now? Yeah, it was definitely really having a chance to play. Uh, in the uh, 81 season, they actually brought up Steve Sachs ahead of me. You know, mm -hmm. they jumped him from double-A to the big league team, and I was in triple-A. So the writing, the writing was on the wall, and, you know, the way it turned out, it was uh, probably the right move, but... For me, I just wanted the opportunity and felt like I deserved it. So going anywhere um, from there was, uh, you know, it was time for me to move on. That's for sure. And then uh, from there, you end up in Seattle, which I guess was a city that you really liked, even though at that time it was really kind of a quirky place with a dome stadium and it was dark and rainy all the time. You know, tell us about Seattle and some of your, your teammates there. Yeah, Seattle was a great move for me because it was my manager I had played for in AAA was Del Crandall. Right. He's the one that kind of traded for me. And so that was kind of the biggest break I ever had. Uh, uh, he believed in me, you know, and even when I would struggle, he'd come up and say, hey, you're my second baseman. So just to have that confidence boost made it easy to play. And, uh, yeah, I like Seattle, uh, the dome, in a sense, because first you knew you were going to play. There was no rain outs, of course. And then. Second, the, the AstroTurf helped my game because I, 
I didn't have great hands or great defensively, and so the, the true hops actually helped me become a better sure. fielder, I felt like. And uh, so, yeah, we had some great young players, and it was an exciting time. You know, guys like Alvin Davis and Mark Langston and mm. Mike Moore and Dave Henderson, the late Dave Henderson, uh, mm-hmm. you know, guys like that. It was just uh, so much Spike Owen, you know, so so much fun to be with those young guys, and we all felt like that we were up and coming at the time. And you mentioned that that 84 season, Jack, yes. was by far your best year. And like you said, I guess going into the building knowing that you're going to play, uh, that was your chance that you probably never had before then. 180 hits that year, 294 with almost 30 stolen bases. That's one hell of a year. And, uh, again, uh, you mentioned some of the great players, but the, the, the King Dome, as far as to us on TV, things like that, Tony, remember, it almost always seemed like a dark place, almost like yeah. any dome in, that, in those days, almost Jack. But it probably was not a bad uh, place to hit as far as uh, being able to see the ball, correct? Yeah, that was better than the other domes. I, I really had trouble in the other domes, like oh. the Metro Dome mm. and the Astrodome, I, I really had trouble with depth perception, but the Kingdome seemed to suit me pretty well. And uh, it probably seemed gloomy to you because the times the games were on back east were so late that's, for you that's guys. That's a good point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but anyway, uh, yeah, it, it was good for my career at the time, that's for sure. And, Jack, you know, you uh, after uh, Chicago, you wind your way back to Los Angeles, and then you're out of baseball. And... Did you still want to play, or did you realize it was the end and you had to do something else? How did all of that come about? Yeah, I pretty much knew it was the end because I was back, like you say, at AAA with the Dodgers in 87, and uh, I didn't have a very good year. So the writing was on the wall at that point that, you know, there's just too many young guys coming up that are going to get their opportunities. So I, I had a chance to uh, fall into something that uh, turned out to be great for me that thing I really loved and uh, everything just worked uh, worked its way for the best you know so I knew at the time that that was that was it for me and just before that uh, you did spend that one year I, in I Chicago, skipped over Chicago. Chicago yeah, yeah and I, I it was it, it, it's interesting to me Tony because uh, that year in Chicago it wasn't a good team but mm-hmm. there was three managers that year and Jack got to play with uh, I think there was three Hall of Famers on that team you guys like Seaver Carlton Fisk were members of that 86 yeah, White right. Sox team, our former guest, Ron Kittle. So you had a combination of guys who were a little, shall we say, flaky, very famous. Uh, and uh, how was that just that one year in the Windy City, Jack? Yeah, it was really amazing, like you say, those guys. But also, you know, Ozzie Gian was there. That's uh, right. Harold Baines. Uh, mm-hmm. There was other great players, too. And uh, just to be part of that and, uh, you know, keep uh, – to be able to play with those guys, and it was basically my hometown, you know, so right. that was really special to me, and uh, I've settled here, you know, in the Chicago area since, so that, that means uh, so much to me. Nice. And, Jack, when you left baseball, was it kind of a uh, like a loose end for you? Did you think that, oh, there's really nothing else I could do? Were you motivated in getting a job in pro ball, or were you led to another direction, or – were you just kind of at a loss at that point? You know, my last year there, I uh, got some counseling as far as uh, starting a baseball academy. You know, the guys that had the San Diego baseball school, they kind of talked about their situation, and they helped me uh, start something in the Chicago area. So in a sense, I felt like I never left the game. It was, mm-hmm. you know, teaching the game, but I was around it, and I've been around it for the last 28 years since I retired. So... I feel like nothing has ever changed, to be honest. I, I go to work at 3 o'clock and work the evenings, and then you work the weekend. So my schedule never changed, and uh, I actually like this more to be around kids and help them to uh, reach their potential. So, uh, you know, I feel very fortunate. I just fell into something that um, I liked actually more than playing. And yeah, uh, you, you can tell about Jack's passion. I mean, uh, if you if you go to Twitter, you can follow Jack. He'll give you updates about uh, his latest things that are going mm-hmm. on. Uh, the website baseballcoaching.tips. It's great, Tony. You can go on there and see a lot of the things. Mm-hmm. And of course, Jack's got four books. The newest book, 2017, Creating a Season to Remember: The New Youth Sports Coaching Leadership Handbook. 
uh, Jack's been kind enough to send me a copy. So, I mean, this is just incredible stuff. It's great work. And uh, as you said, the way you got into baseball instruction, Jack, is incredible. You know, the, the, it, and Tony had mentioned this in his notes as far as you were a contact hitter, uh, a guy that played uh, small ball and knew how to play small ball. And these days, uh, for these young kids you work with, Jack, they're going to go into a baseball. If they ever get to the level, it is a counterintuitive type, uh, the way they play these days. It's, it's like all or nothing. Uh, strikeouts are not frowned upon. And uh, how do you deal with that, Jack, with these kids that kind of grow up watching guys swing for the fences? Yeah, I kind of use that uh, to help in a sense because I try to tell them that, you know, the, a really good swing uh, can produce a swing and miss. So I don't want them to get too down because they, you know, swing and miss occasionally because mm -hmm. kids nowadays, they really are hard on themselves and they got a lot of pressure on them. So every time they do swing and miss, they they take it to heart. So in a way, I kind of use that uh, for for their good. But on the other hand, kind of like you're saying, uh, if they strike out too much, they're going to lose totally com total confidence and probably end up, end up on the bench at, at their level. So uh, it's all about, you know, making contact for them and, uh, you know, getting hits and putting the ball in play. So it, it is definitely uh, two different games that you see on TV and you, and, and you see with kids, that's for sure. Jack, what are the... Uh, ranges of ages of the kids you work with? I mean, is, is it a point where you can get these kids young enough to teach them fundamentals and, and the importance of hustle and things like that? Tell us the ages of kids that you normally deal with. Yeah, I work with all ages. I, I love all ages of kids, to be honest. So there's, I have a six-year-old I'm working with a little later tonight. Wow. And because he can, yeah, he can, he's shown that he can concentrate for a half hour, which is really amazing for that age. <laughs> it is. But, <laughs> He's, he's, he's got a love of it, and uh, I just finished uh, working with a softball girl uh, that plays in college. So I, I like all ages, wow. and if they're, they're interested in learning, uh, I, I really enjoy working with all kids. So there's no age uh, limits, uh, in a sense. Hmm. And, Jack, when we talk about coaching, we talk about kids, I do recall – if I remember correctly, the last time out, uh, you had told us you like that single sport approach for kids. Obviously, it worked well for you. And today we have kids doing everything, being everything, going from place to place to place to activity. Do you still feel that way, you know, get one sport, like it, and do your best at it? Or should kids experience different things up to a certain age? Yeah, up until high school, I would say play as many as you can. I've always felt that way, you know. I, I, I try to encourage the coaches around here to, you know, don't don't have season-long programs, which a lot of them do. You know, they they play summer ball, and then they play fall ball, and then they start their workouts again in, you know, December or January, and the kids have very little time off, so it almost becomes a year-round thing. And mm -hmm. until high school age, at least, I don't believe in that, so... I like to see them, uh, you know, playing all different sports up until the high school age. And, and things, you know, at that age, just like for me, it tends to work themselves out. You know, most kids probably aren't good enough anymore to play three sports, and that's fine. But until high school age, uh, you know, I think they should um, play all three or play as many as they can and have other interests besides just uh, one sport, you know. Interesting. I think all the, all the studies are showing that, Specialization at a young age isn't uh, isn't worthwhile for for anybody. Mm -hmm. Jack, talk to us about the new book. I mean, it's creating a season to remember. You uh, you give hints online about what some of the things that are in the book and things like that. It's on the field, off the field, parenting, kind of a all around approach. Uh, really good stuff. Tell us more about the impetus in writing this book. Well, I've been around this a long time, and, you know, I've seen how coaches uh, work with kids and uh, seen some of the issues. You know, I've had so many parents and kids come in over the years and just say, oh, or the, the coach is an idiot or the coach doesn't know what he's doing. And, you know, I kind of took that to heart and realized that there's a need to help coaches because most of them have great intentions when they start. They just have never been trained. Uh, you know, to bring the best out of kids and not only kids, to bring the best out of parents. Now, you know, coaches, uh, 
they, they have a responsibility to keep their parents in line and, uh, uh, you know, also. So I, I just felt there was a big need for helping uh, everybody. And so I've been working at that book for seven years. I, I, I really put a lot of effort into it, uh, try to get it right. And uh, it, it's a guide that covers about every situation that coaches will find themselves in. And, uh, you know, it's all about inspiring others and, um, not only that, so that coaches feel good about what they've done, you know, too. And they, so many coaches get disillusioned because they feel like they're never helping kids or inspiring them. And so this coach is, this book is for coaches uh, mm-hmm. themselves also to feel good about uh, the work they're doing with kids. So it's really all encompassing uh, in, in my mind to help the whole youth sports uh, situation, which needs help. Yeah, and, and Jack, when we talk about that, I I read with interest your article about things you can do to the game of baseball to make it more fun, to make it more action, um, putting pitchers on a strict seconds count and, you know, having a, a hitter uh, hit the ball for a single and make it a double and all that. And um, I, I, I thought that was really neat. I thought that was creative and out of the box, but... And but does baseball have bigger problems in the sense that the uh, ticket prices are very high? One o'clock games get moved to eight o'clock. Uh, kids fall asleep at night trying to watch games. I mean, shouldn't baseball be helping itself more? Oh, I think so. And you know that was the the article was basically a facetious look at things, but the whole point was to get kids interested in watching baseball again you know it's not at the games that is the big problem it's you know getting them to grow up watching and listening to it like Mm -hmm. we used to and sure if you you know if you don't have those kids at this age you're certainly not going to have them in when they when they're adults and so i think that's where baseball has a big problem is you know keeping getting kids interested in uh following it and watching it again and uh so that's the article was kind of a funny look at trying to change the game in the sense to get kids where they would really enjoy watching it because you have crazy scores and just, you know, right. just a different, different. I thought it was neat. I really did. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just kind of, once again, just sort of a funny look at things, but yeah, baseball definitely, I think has a problem and it's not the necessarily the attendance at the games that's getting kids to watch. And like you say, the hours of it, once the world series comes and games are going on so midnight or 11 o'clock it's mm. like you know this is your world series and kids have no chance of even watching so to watch that kind of drives, drives me nutty and jack uh, we got a couple more minutes here I, I was wondering out of all your your seven years in the game and etc what uh, who are some of the players you played with uh, that you were came became really close to maybe that ones that r- remain uh, pretty close friends to this day you know, all of my close friends were the ones I came up with in the minor league, uh, you yeah. know, and those are the ones uh, you, you tend to create a bond with more than once you get to the big league. So, once you know, once you get to that level, it's a little more of a job. Um, and and so my best friends are were the guys that I came up through the minor leagues, and some of them made it to the big leagues and some didn't, but those are the guys that I, uh, you know, stay in touch with and uh, we, we've remained friends. And, you know, some of them, I haven't seen in many, many years, and if I saw him tomorrow, you'd feel like you never missed a day between them. You were such close friends back in the day. So that's the, the great thing about baseball, I think. And with all your work with the kids these days, Jack, and your, your, your author uh, efforts and all the things you're involved with, do you have a chance to watch baseball a lot, either on TV or in person? I, I do, you know, uh, I have a hard time maybe sitting through three hours myself, you sure, know, I'll, sure. mm-hmm. I'll pick up innings here and there, but, but I, you know, I'm still learning about the game too, and so you, you have to watch the greatest players, uh, see how they do things, and I learn a lot from just watching, so I enjoy watching it so I can keep learning, and, you know, I, I like watching the Little League World Series too, because there's things you can learn there, and you have to stay in touch with what's being played, you know, so you can help your kids uh, of that age, too. So, yeah, I, I do my best to watch as much as I can. Tony, you have a final question? I for do. And, Jack, what are some of the better or perhaps the harder 
life lessons that baseball taught you? Well, I think um, resiliency is probably number one. You know, I'm always telling my students that, you know, that's not going to be the last time you miss a ball. That's not going to be the last error you make. So you have to learn to bounce back. So, you know, developing resilient players, and I think that's the thing I learned. And I remember Del Crandall once coming up to me when I had a rough time in my career, and he just said, you know, if that's the worst thing that happens to you and you're, life it's not so bad and that kind of puts things in perspective mm. so i think that you know teaching resiliency and the other thing i try to make the message to my kids is that you know it's all about the hard work that you put into it that, you know very few of you are going to be if any of you are going to be major league players but if you develop the proper work ethic uh it's going to help you in every phase of your life and so that's what i try to I try to show them a good work ethic, and then I try to teach them how to go about that so that, you know, they're successful in the classroom and they're successful on the field and off the field. So those are probably the two most important things I try to get across to kids. Again, and that's uh, great. for our viewers out there, Jack's new book, Creating a Season to Remember, the New Youth Sports Coaching Leadership Handbook. We uh, urge people to go to baseballcoaching.tips, follow Jack on Twitter. You'll find a lot more about this, and you could probably use a lot of Jack's stuff. If you have children or if you're just interested in the subject, it's great stuff. Jack, I know you have a birthday uh, later next week, so an early birthday to you. And, well, thank you so uh, much, guys. Happy we birthday, also, Jack. Uh, but, uh, again, we can't thank you enough for coming on again. It's, it's been too long, and uh, we'll Certainly continue has. to ta stay in touch and keep doing the great work, Jack. We really respect what you do. It's really encouraging. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate it, guys. Uh, good luck to you both. Take care. Thank you. Good night, Jack. Take care, Bob. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Jack Percani, Tony, good friend of the show.